Today on the show, I have the pleasure of speaking with April Crosley. April is the founder of Lazy Girl REI and Crosley Property Group. Now, April was a teenage mum, but now she is building multiple millions dollars worth of wealth, and she's known as the wealth grower. And she is on a mission to change many lives as possible by teaching people how to grow wealth in real estate. G'day, April. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Well, t- tell the listeners, where are you dialing in from today? Uh, Pennsylvania. Lovely. How's the weather going there this time of year? Starting to get into the summer? Yeah, warming up. Thank That's goodness. Awesome. Yep. That's awesome. Well, look, I, I like to ask everyone on the show to kick it off is rewind the, the clock and tell me how you made your first ever dollar as a kid. Oh, my first ever dollar as a kid. That's a great question. I don't know that I really remember that from when I was little, little. I just know we always had to do chores for money when we were younger. Always. My parents uh, lived um, very conservatively and they had four kids. So they were kind of like, we had four kids so you can do chores. So like, (laughs) A birthday present when you turned eight years old was you get to learn how to mow the lawn and for <laughs> for like whatever five dollars and we thought that was a big huge deal like I can't wait to learn how to mow the lawn when I'm eight and <laughs> right. like um so I think from just like doing chores and then I always had jobs from the time I was like fifteen years old on typically in like the restaurant business and stuff like that until I went to college awesome yeah. awesome well walk us through the story of 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 what who is April Crosley and then how you got into building wealth through real estate? Sure. So I, um, I had my son very young when I was 16. I'm very transparent about that with everyone because I like to let people know I had nothing. I come from middle-class parents that, uh, do not like wealthy people. They say a lot of negative things about wealthy people. (laughs) Um, My dad owned his own HVAC business and my mom was like one level below the CEO in a hospital. I had my son when I was 16, had to go back to high school and finish my senior year of high school. And then I went to college. So I was raising my son, driving to college, dropping my son off at daycare. It was a grind. I tell people I pretty sure I probably had some form of post-traumatic stress disorder Mm. because I would sleep like four hours a night. And that was a lot. Like if I slept four hours, that was great because I had to squeeze everything else in. Um, I was on welfare because I couldn't, I was working part-time in like a restaurant. I was also working part-time at a hospital doing clerk type entries um, because I was in college for a healthcare, healthcare degree. So I was just trying to make ends meet. So I feel like I like to be transparent about being a teenage mom because I tell people there's, I don't ever want anyone to go through that feeling I had to go through of like sitting in a welfare office and the way people treat you when you pay for groceries at the grocery store with government assistance um, and the looks that you get and not having any money and just wanting a better life for my son. Like I remember just thinking to myself, my son will never be in these circumstances. I will never let him pay for groceries with food stamps. I will never let him have to feel what I feel sitting in this welfare office. Um, So I I was renting my own house, was on food stamps, was driving to college, graduated from college, had a great degree in healthcare, was making good money, still renting a house, had met my now husband at the time, picked up a book he had on real estate investing. And that's kind of how it got started. And I was really financially uneducated. So you want to talk about I didn't know how to balance a checkbook. My paychecks would go into my bank account from the hospital and I would go to the ATM machine to see how much money was in my account to see if I could spend money that day. That's how I lived back then. Um, And when my husband met me, he had two small rental properties and he said to me, why are you renting a house? And I was like, why wouldn't I rent a house? Like I need somewhere to live. I've been living here for years. And he's like, you should buy a house. I'm like, why would anyone do that? Like I didn't, understand that at all. Um, So I picked up this book and started reading. It was called The One Minute Millionaire. And I started reading about all these people that bought property and people lived in them and paid off the mortgage. And then they got to keep all the equity in the home. And I was like, why would someone pay off someone else's house? And I still couldn't connect the dots. And my husband's like, you're paying off your landlord's 
house. Like that's what you're doing. You're paying off his house and then you're going to move out and he's going to sell it. And he's going to get to keep all that equity. And I was shocked. I was like, how do I do that? Like, how do I buy a house like that? Um, so really my husband was my first mentor kind of, and he just had two small rentals and eventually he became a realtor, but I bought a house, moved into it, fixed it up, moved out, turned it into a rental and did that probably three or four times. So we house hacked, moved out, turned it into a rental and then took like a course and got into flipping houses and buying small multifamily. And at one point I was like, I'm just going to talk about what I'm doing on YouTube because I would follow a bunch of people in real estate and I felt like they would talk about it, but not give you the whole like answer to things. And I knew nothing about YouTube. So I just went on there and started talking. And then my following on YouTube got bigger and people were like, you should really coach. You're buying a lot of properties and flipping a lot of properties. I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to coach. I don't want to coach. I don't want to coach. Then I ended up coaching. <laughs> um, and now like flash forward, I still buy small multifamily. I passively invest in syndications. We do a lot of private lending. Um, I co-GP on syndications and raise capital and help with putting syndications together. I bought a mobile home park. Now I kind of dabble in a whole bunch of uh, different things, but still um, everything I do, I do to have impact, basically. Like, why am I doing this project and how is it going to impact the community I'm buying it in, the people I'm buying it with, um, or my life or whatever. I really want to help change people's lives and help people grow wealth. And that's people that have nothing to people that have really good jobs, but are stuck in the grind of just getting a paycheck and investing in the stock market. And they're not really growing any wealth. So they don't realize when they retire, they're not really going to be able to support themselves the way they think they will. If that makes sense. Yes. Yes. No, yeah. 100%. Well, look, so much to unpack there. I think the story around the welfare uh, check and that the feeling that you had of going into the supermarket and being judged, like just yeah. the way you described that, I could, I felt for you. Like, I feel like, yeah, I could feel those looks. Like, I, I didn't grow up with any money either. I, I, I'm not a teenage mum, <laughs> I'm not a yeah. teenage dad, but I could only imagine the, you know, I empathize with you that, yeah, that, that, that would create, um, nearly like a callus, right? A, a subconscious yeah. callus that you're like, I never, ever, ever want my son to go through this. So yes. you come from a place of, of pain and you, you're you forced into doing something and changing your mindset. And I think that's ultimately how you're describing, like your husband talking about the rent, like, no, that you're paying the landlord's mortgage for them, you know, for yeah. him or her. And, and, and you're, you're building their equity for them. Oh, and that that light bulb moment, I I can see it in, in the story. That's that's fantastic. And how do you do you use your story today to help empower other women uh, in your situation that that maybe think that there's no other alternative than to just work and grind and go to the ATM and check how much money you've got in the bank account? Yeah, you know what? I feel like I do just in everyday life in the smallest circumstances, like. We bought a mobile home park and obviously it's a lower income community that we're serving. And when we went in, we had to raise rents. We have to raise rents. They're way below market, way below market. So to buy it at what the seller wanted, he knew we were going to have to go in and raise rents. He's mom and pop seller. So we went in prepared. Like I'm coming in, I'm raising rent, but I want you to know that I'm here to support you. So we provided our tenants a list of like, if you need um, extra food, here's the food banks that give out food for free. You don't even have to qualify for benefits. Here's the food banks in the area. If you want to apply for Section 8 housing, here is um, the number to call for that. Just, it really taught me in life to never judge anyone. I approach everyone like, I'm going to believe in you and you can be whatever you want to be in life. I don't care what circumstances you're coming from. When I was young and had my son, my best friend at the time, her dad said to me, congratulations. Now your son's going to be a teenage dad. And now you started this vicious cycle of just like repetitive generations that are going to be on welfare. And I was like, wow, am more I like, going more like, to more like, prove, fuck you, dude. Yeah. Am <laughs> I going to prove you wrong? So 
I, a lot of times I feel like people in those situations, so like you're going to sit down with them and say, you know, we have to raise your rent and like, good luck. Like you can either pay it or you can't like get out. And I don't believe in approaching anything like that. We approach it with love. Like I'm going to help you and connect you with resources. And if you need help with your financial decision-making, or you want us to look at your bills or trying to help you out in another way, we're here to do that, to serve you. Yeah. Look, that's so important. Uh, particularly coming through the COVID impacts we've had, right? Like a lot of like, I think that's really emphasized the need and and myself as a property owner, uh, you know, I, I, it's really people first, right? If I don't have my tenants, I don't have cash flow. I don't, can't pay the mortgage. I can't pay my investors. I don't have a syndication. I don't have a business. So I, you know, for me as an owner, like probably leading up to COVID, I was more thinking of it like, you know, you're in my property, you know, you got to pay rent. But yeah, having that people first mentality is really, really important. Um, has it ever come back and bit you in the butt at all recently? <laughs> when, when, when people take too much advantage of you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I had to recently fire a project manager in my business who was I just have a soft heart for single moms, especially. Mm -hmm. So I will just, I tend to overlook some hiccups in people's personalities, thinking that I can help them and change them and help them grow and mature into who I think they can be because they're so amazing. But sometimes that does come back to bite me in the butt for Mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Because people then in that case, this person just kind of got this arrogance, like she worked with me and then started like talking down to my contractors and treating my contractors like they were less than because she would manage the project. And I'm like, no one is less than we, and I tried to fix it and fix it and fix it. And it was just her personality and it was not fixable. So I had to let her go. So yeah. Then after I let her go, everyone's like, yeah, we did not like her, but I just kept trying and trying. So I'm like, you have so much talent and you could be so much, um, yeah, so I feel like sometimes my soft heart can be blinding as well. Mm. Has yeah. that, has that changed your hiring process now? Does that giving you any better insights into making sure that you're giving it, getting a team around you of people? And this goes for anyone starting out and in investing. Having that sense of that this person's gonna, you know, sixth sense. Oh, oh this person's gonna work out. and This person's gonna do great because I'm gonna teach them. But it comes. The rubber hits the road at some stage. So, did you change any of your processes in that way that you could give to the audience as sort of advice to say this is how a good way to weed out X, Y, Z? Yeah, I feel like just communicating with my team more. And when I say my team, like my contractors, my acquisition person, everyone else involved in whether it's the house buying process or apartment buying process making sure I'm consciously taking time to touch base with them to say like, what do you love about your position and what do you hate about your position and how is it going working with this person or working with that person? And like, after this happened with my project managers, just going back to people who have kind of been regulars on my team and saying, you know, I value you and your input and whatever you say to me is going to stay with me. But if you have a bad feeling about someone and things aren't going well, you need to tell, you need to tell me because I need to take care of it. Um, so yeah, just opening the lines of communication more and making sure you have those conversations. I feel like sometimes we get really comfortable with the people on our team and we're like, oh, things are humming along. So we're not checking in with our team members like we should. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's so important as you build businesses and and I know we're going to get into house hacking and, 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 and you know, breaking that down, but I think this is part of your message early on that you were talking about when you get on YouTube and explaining things to them. Like this, these are managing people, right? When you grow a business, uh-huh. when you get to a point where you need employees, you need to go be, become more than just a, a solo entrepreneur because it's where we all start from, right? When you, you have a bit of money in the bank, you can finally pay someone. Thank God they can help us. Yeah. But, but you have your blinders up then because you're, you're putting so much trust into those people. And that's only going to, through these hard times of hard, and hard, hard conversations, is that only going to build better processes for you as an entrepreneur to create a team, even though it might be a small team, you know, to, to do their job at the best capacity that's going to help promote the the investors' money and the deal and and all the rest of it and and really you know row in the right direction to your vision because that's ultimately what they're what they're being employed for. So yes. I think there's there's always lessons in that even during hard times. You mentioned earlier 
about your YouTube channel and how you're breaking down, you know, explaining stuff a little bit more easily for, for, for people. Do you want to walk us through what types of topics you like to educate people on on the channel? Yeah. So I just really like to break. I just talk about everything I'm doing at the moment. And I feel like I'm very transparent. So even if something's going sideways or I have a bad deal, I'm like, I'm going to talk about this because people need to know what's going on here. So like we posted a video about buying the mobile home park. And I think in the upcoming month, we'll do like an update video. Like here's what's happening with the mobile home park. Here's things we didn't expect (laughs) that are happening. Um, And here's the things that are going well. I just try to be really transparent. And when I, I'll break down numbers of deals that I'm doing. So like I bought an eight unit on seller finance. So I broke down the whole thing. Like it took me whatever, six months to negotiate this deal with the seller. Here's the deal that I negotiate. Here are all my numbers, everything, taxes, insurance, like vacancy, maintenance. Here's exactly how I structured the private loan with the seller. And here's how it was recorded. And like, I think just everything from A to Z, because that's how I learn. I learn by doing, but I also learn by someone breaking down every single little step in the process and mapping it out for me. So that's what I try to do with deals. We'll do like deal or dud, like if something's a deal or dud, or we did a video this past week on like what to look for in a partner. Like if you're Mm -hmm. taking on a partner for a project, um, which just comes from really hard lessons of having difficult partners. (laughs) So yeah. What what being the most passionate thing about a topic that you've explained recently that we can maybe break down here on the show today? Like something that is, you mentioned partnerships. I just came out of partnership myself. You know, maybe that's something we can talk about. Uh, you know, breaking down an eight unit seller carry back financing is always something interesting because that seems to be the golden chalice, seller carry back finance, off market, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But yeah. getting that to the finish line is also extremely difficult. Yes. So what what's what's the most passionate? I'm probably most passionate about that. And I tell people that all the time. I love small mom and pop multifamilies that I can sell or finance. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's where my best multifamily deals are at. And I just love working with mom and pop sellers. I mean, even on the mobile home park, we did, we financed it with a bank and then we did a second with the mom and pop. So we have a seller second. But I just feel like you have these older sellers that want to sell. And it takes a long time to close the deal because a lot of them are attached to the property. Like they're emotionally attached to it. They've had it for a while. So it takes a while of them trusting you and building rapport. And um, it's not even necessarily always about the price. I mean, when I sell or finance the, that eight unit years ago, the gentleman I bought it from said, I want you to promise me that this guy in apartment for his rent will never change for the for the life that he lives here. It's an older gentleman and he can't afford any more than that. And he's not well. And I know he'll never be able to work. So you have to promise me it'll stay. And I just promised him on a handshake. And I've never changed that guy's rent. He's still there to this day. He pays like $400 a month, which is unheard of for like a one bedroom apartment out in the country. Um, those are my favorite type of deals. And also the deals I probably get the most questions about. Or the seller financed. Well, let's break it down then, because I'm, I'm my background's in engineering. I love to break things apart and put it back together again. So, yeah. let's talk about the marketing process because I think that's where it starts, right? Everyone's mm-hmm. like, let's 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 go get a seller carryback financing deal. Well, I know in today's market, I'm I'm buying things over 100 units. I ain't getting any off market right. deals. I'm a seller. I'm I'm, about to, I'm selling three deals right now. They're all over 150 units. I ain't transacting yeah. offline because I'm just a little bit different. Yeah, you know, I've got a bit more of a, not I'll just say sophisticated mindset. I'm just, yeah. that's how the game's played. But yes, some yes. 100 units, there's an opportunity there. So talk to us about how you went and marketed that. And, and are you focusing on sub 100 units? Maybe you are focusing on bigger units. I don't yeah. know. Um, we do focus on sub 100 units. Yep. Yeah. And I don't. I don't even mind smaller stuff. Like I'd buy any, we, the mobile home park we bought was pretty small. It was only 22 pads. I'd buy another 22 unit again. I'd buy another 10 units. As long as I have the team in place where I'm buying the property, that's most important. But the marketing for the smaller kind of off-market deals, I mean, we do direct to seller marketing, like a very pretty letter with like a picture of me and my dog or me and my husband <laughs> and my dog. And we put a line At the bottom of the letter, we basically say in the letter, like, we're not looking to buy at some deep discount wholesale price. Um, 
here's our criteria. We'd love to talk to you. We'll gather all the information on the phone. We're not going to disrupt your tenants unless we know we're in the same ballpark as price. And then at the bottom of the letter, I put a little line that says um, something like tired of being a landlord, but still want to make cash flow from the property. Ask me how I can take over your tenants, all your repairs and everything and still make you you'll still get paid every month from the property. And it's like a hook, like sellers will call and be like, what does this mean? You're going to buy the property, but I'm going to get paid every single month from the tenants. I don't, what do you mean by that? And that just opens up the doors for the seller financing conversation. And and how many of these letters are you sending out every month? Is is it a system that, that you can break down for the listeners? Yeah, you know what? I'm not... I can honestly say I'm not great at the multifamily, like mom and pop mailers, like consistent, like I am, like I still have a flip business with a partner and a wholesale business. And that runs like clockwork. The multifamily is just more personal touch kind of mailers. So when we do them, we usually do them like sometimes once a month, once every other month, sometimes I'll go like, if I'm busy, cause we bought the mobile home park and we're buying like this, some houses for seniors down in Tennessee, I might go like six months and just forget to do the mail because I'm the one doing it. Like, I don't have it automated. Um, But like last month, I think I sent out or this month, I just did it like a week or two again. I think I ordered like three or four thousand mailings. And what you said earlier about sophistication in this market is very true. And people have to take that into consideration. Like I bought that eight unit. You're dealing with a tired, worn out mom and pop seller that's aging, can't keep up with repairs and vacancy and turnover because he's do it yourself, doing everything himself. I don't work like that. So, but if you have someone that calls you and they have a 30 unit and it's running like clockwork for them and making money and they have no motivation to like hang on to that thing and make some money off of it, they're not really going to want to sell or finance it to you. And if they do sell, they're going to want to put it on the market because that's the name of the game right now. That bidding war like people paying crazy prices for things. That's what's happening right now. So you're looking for that small mom and pop that has some kind of motivation. So either a multifamily property that has code violations on it, or just the seller's owned it a long time. It's paid off, but they still want to make money from it, but they maybe own one or two properties. They're not like really heavy into real estate investing. They work another job. It's just kind of like a side gig. Those are the type of sellers that we're looking for. Right. And so you're, you're really playing the long game here. You're playing the consistent yeah. long game. You know your markets that you're in. You probably drive yeah. them. You probably have other people drive them. You're just keeping warm touches every couple of months. So I just want people, I wanted to reiterate for the listeners that, you know, I think there's, there's this adage of automate, 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 automate. But when markets are shifting as they are, and to your point of even a 30-unit property, a 30-unit owner who has something that is going like clockwork, got a property manager, it's all working well, they're probably going to get the, the most bang for their buck, right? They're not just going to be like, oh, what's this yellow letter that I've got and, yes. and I'm going to transact offline. Yeah. It's the consistency and then also looking for those little issues, code violations, tax issues, um, yes. long-term ownership, right? All yeah. that stuff. So um, question on that, where do you, what, 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 what data source do you use to, to grab all that information? Is there something that you, Property Shark, is there something more that you pay for? Right now I'm using public records from like, my son's a real estate agent and we can access public records in our local area. Then outside my local area, I'm using Prospect Now. Prospect Now. Got it. Okay. Awesome stuff. So once you've got them on the hook, they yep. want to, they want to know more about what you're doing. What's the contract or contractual language you're putting in there to have the seller carry back finance? And are you putting any down payment down with them? Yeah. So we'll usually put a down payment in escrow, like with the title company. Um, We do a simple one page contract that just states like, this is the price we're going to buy it for. Seller's going to finance at whatever, 5% on a 30 year amortization with a five year balloon. Um, And this is the purchase price. And then the contract and the down money goes to the title company. And then in Pennsylvania, we use notes and mortgages. And that's where most of my small mom and pop buildings are in my local market. So we'll have a note and a mortgage drawn up by the attorney. And then the seller, we usually give them the option like, hey, your attorney can draw this up 
or our attorney does this all the time and they can draw it up and your attorney can check it. What are you most comfortable with? Because obviously everyone's worried about like getting ripped off somehow. And I can tell you in seller financing, one of my business partners is working a seller financing deal right now and she's exhausted. I'm like, you've only been talking to the seller for like six weeks. Like it's okay. This takes time. He wanted to meet her husband. He wanted to like do his due diligence on her to make sure she would be able to make her payments. He called other private lenders that she had to make sure she was making payments to them. They don't want to be bamboozled, you know? (laughs) So they really want to like you. They want to like you. And because of that and just being a good person, you have to have patience. Like when you're doing these deals, it's not like, this is what I'm offering you, take it or leave it. It's really what is important to you. You know, is the monthly payment important to you? Is the net amount at the end important to you? Is getting X amount of interest important to you? So usually I'll, before I even make them an offer, I'll draw up a spreadsheet with three or four different offers. So different interest rates, different net amounts, different down money. If you can get it with no down money, great. And some sellers have done that. And I let them choose like, hey, which one of these looks best to you? And it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be a starting point for our conversation to get us rolling into how this works. Right, right. And I think that's key going back to the consistency is you have to go in with the mindset. I wrote the word mindset down that if you're going to go in there thinking it's going to happen like at the snap of your fingers, you, yeah. you, like take a breath, right? Usually these people are going to be older they're going to take their maybe do a little bit of old school in terms of how they approach yes. business. So seeing the husband, seeing the wife, maybe even meeting the kids, you know, that's yeah. just part that's just part of the territory, right? And, and, yes. and I think that's you've got to once you get your head around that and know that this may take six to twelve months, it's okay. I actually just got off a phone call with a good friend of mine. Um, got an off-market deal. It was a bigger deal, more of a sophisticated seller, but they it took him six months to get the person to where they were signing a contract. And he was consistently just touching base with them. And the way he got there was because he knew he knew through seller records that it was an LLC. He could be able to penetrate the LLC to see who owned it and somehow figured out that there was a tennis, something to do with tennis, right? Yeah. Writes him a letter. Somehow the ten, like through the University of XYZ, he'd played tennis against... Like yes, he's, he's either his son or his brother-in-law's son, like something weird, like it was yes. super weird. And that's how the, 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 the string starts. And this is a deal that the bloke's only owned it for like 18 months. It wasn't even a long-term ownership. It was just like, I don't want to transact with a broker. I'm just going to transact with this guy who's, I could transact with a broker, but he's going to pay me, he's still paying me sort of around the market value for it. But it was like, he would have to be consistent with it. Um, yeah. So I know, I know another person who, uh, the again seller character, not seller character, but 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 a direct to seller, and they were they would something was going on, but they wouldn't give the property financials over to the bank to go out and get debt, and they ultimately had to drop the property. But I said to him probably two days ago, I was like, "Look, dude, I reckon just hang around the hoop, it will come back, it will come yeah. back to you. Something's going on. I don't think yeah. it's your fault." It's, it, and they're saying, "Oh, why don't you just pu- buy it all cash?" And it's like this is a. This is a $15 million deal. No one's buying this all cash, right? You're getting leverage on this thing. Like, and so it was all about these, not necessarily mind games, but clearly something was going on on the seller's side that they didn't want to be forthcoming with the financials and thus the bank couldn't even get on board. The bank's not on board, you don't have a deal. So either you go, so I just give those two examples because I was literally just talking to someone the other day. Even in this world of frothiness, institutional buyers, blah, blah, blah. It was in Phoenix market, actually, which is, I was yeah, out there crazy yesterday. crazy hot market. Crazy hot market. I looked, yeah. I toured six deals yesterday and with six, six different brokers. It was insane. But um, but anyway, I, back to the point, it was just about consistency and mindset. If you're going to go into this business, you have to realize they are needles in the haystack, but if you've got mm-hmm. time, if you've got consistency, um. You, you will be successful. There is scalability to it, which I, you know we can talk about, but in general, having that high level of, of, of taking your time. Um, so, so April, what do you, what's the plan for, for yourself? Like you're, you're helping others now, you're YouTubing, you've got your own businesses. It sounds like you're starting to invest passively in other deals. Where, where do you want the business to go right now? Yeah. So this year I'm really, really heavy focused on um, 
projects that have impact in helping like lower income families. And when I started thinking about that at the end of last year, I'm like, I don't really know what that's going to look like. And we ended up buying the mobile home park last year. And now this year we're buying some big houses that we're basically going to use for like co-living for seniors that are coming out of homeless shelters and transitioning into like a regular life. So we're working on buying those. And then we're looking at some apartment buildings, like larger apartment buildings that, um, are basically for like low income families, like HUD buildings. And I just am super passionate about affordable housing and like creating some kind of either co-living or affordable housing for families. So really, I just want to keep doing projects that have impact. Ultimately, I'd love to build like a senior affordable housing community. And senior just stems from like, I took care of my grandmother for a long time. I worked in healthcare. So I see this big gap of where seniors can't afford luxury apartment buildings. And they also can't afford most care facilities because they're thousands of dollars a month, but they can't live in their two-story home anymore. So they need something affordable in between. And unfortunately, social security and pensions are not keeping up with inflation. Like I know I'm preaching to the choir here with this audience, but I talked to so many seniors that are like, you know, when I when I knew this was what my social security would be and I retired, I didn't realize costs were going to go way up here. And now I can barely afford to live. And unfortunately, we see that story more and more and more. And if you look at senior homelessness stats, they're like through the roof. Mm. So I really, my focus right now is doing projects where I can have a huge impact and help low income families and um, the homeless senior population. Interesting. Have you have you thought about any of the tax credits that are exist with, you know, partnering with a nonprofit, either starting a nonprofit yourself and yes. then you get an abatement. I know a lot of tax a lot of states with higher real estate taxes, usually they don't have income tax, like Texas, South Carolina. There are, there are programs out there for people, for investors to essentially nearly in my experience, it's been it's nearly like a form of rent restriction, right? You you put a yes. you, you cap it at a certain AMI, average median income. You can't go above what the HUD uh, publishes every year for the county on one, twos, and three bedrooms, but for the for in return you get to get a tax break. So are you thinking any of that, yes. that, 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 that along those types of lines? Yep, my partner that I'm working with on all these things has a nonprofit um, and has had a meeting with someone that specializes in tax credits, and we've hired a mentor that like works with people like us that want to do things like this, like buy buildings that are meant for low income families. So we're in the very beginning stages and it's honestly been really overwhelming. It's so much to learn. And like anything with the government, there's so many like ins and outs. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, it comes back to patience. And like, if we have the patience and we can really get a handle on this and learn it, like we know everything else, like we know seller financing and no flipping and no small multis, we're going to be able to just like crush it and dominate and have a massive impact in multiple states for low income families. So it's exciting. Love it. I love yeah. it. Really interesting. On a side note, one of the deals I toured yesterday uh, was uh, uh, built in, I think it was built in the 70s, but it was a single story, low density property in Phoenix. And you walk into it and it's now multifamily, but it is, it feels a little bit like a senior, it was built for senior housing. Um, and, you know, huge rec center abandoned kitchen like the kitchen doesn't even get used like long yeah. corridors that feel like uh like like a hospital um yeah. and apart as a buyer i'm sort of saying to myself you know to the to the to the property manager i was like you know what's the who's your demographic here again over 55 because it's got that stigma of the property and so yeah. as a as a full market renter or sort of buyer i'm thinking well if i'm going to come in here and and and, and want to bring the mar- rents up to market 15 1600 bucks maybe these people can't afford it, right? And so does that and, – and then I've got to think about, well, if I'm trying to advertise to the younger crew, are they going to want to live in a hospital-feeling-like type of property? So it was really kind of interesting having this conversation with you because I literally just walked to property and I was like, this is multifamily, but it's really senior, senior housing. How can I flip the – you know, do I even want to flip the rent roll? And, and I don't think I can because of the way the property is laid out and the way it's designed because – Again, if I'm a young 22-year-old, do I want to be walking some corridors, you know, of like right. a, an abandoned 
rec center? <laughs> you know, you know who you want to talk to that's really interesting is that property is fascinating. The first call I made was to just like Googling senior housing services in the state that we're doing it in. And this, there's like a senior housing program coordinator. And I was like, hey, where is the senior housing need in this county? What are they paying and what's considered affordable rent? And is that a shared bedroom or a single bedroom? And how much do you think I can get? Then she connected me with the local homeless shelter who was like, listen, if you have stuff, we have people living here at like 500 per bed seniors. They share a room. She's like, they can pay more than that, like 650, 700. They don't care about sharing a room because they like the social atmosphere of it. And she's like, they don't need to be in the homeless shelter anymore, but they can't find anything affordable. So whereas you may think like one room, 650 a month's affordable, but then we were like, okay, one room, two beds. Is that viable? And could you fill that? And she's like, I could send you 12 people tomorrow. She's like, literally tomorrow and fill your entire house that you're buying. She's like, from people that are walkie talkie, take care of themselves, actually would enjoy living in co-living and your bedroom is going to be way bigger than what they're living in now. Yeah. So we're kind of getting our rent by doing the like Double shared density. bedroom model. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, interesting. That's awesome. That's that's great. Well, look, I, I I could keep talking to you for hours, but I know I want to get to the end of the show. And at the end of every show, we like to dive into the top five investing tips. You ready to get into it? Ready. Let's do it. Well, tell me. Number one question is how do you, what's the daily habit you practice to keep on track towards your goals? Um, always gratefulness. Yeah, every morning I wake up, do a gratefulness journal. Um read my Bible and go to the gym. That's pretty much my every day. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Question number two is who's the most influential person in your career to date? A lot of people. So I would have to say I have a coach. His name is Michael Manthe. He's based out of Pennsylvania as well. He's probably like the most influential person in my life right now, (laughs) like has changed me from just like uh, has made me a better business owner, has made me a better person, just everything. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Michael, yeah. if you're listening, uh, you are April's most influential <laughs> person. That's awesome. Question number three is, who, what is the most influential tool in your business? Then when, when I say tool, it could be a physical tool like a journal or a phone, or it could be a piece of software that you just can't run the business without. What is it? We use a ton of tools and software, but I could tell you like outside of tools and software from a like scaling my business perspective, mm-hmm. I've used private money lenders since 2004 and I have great relationships with private money lenders and my business would not grow and would not tick without them. Interesting. Interesting. So you, you it actually comes down to relationships is the best tool. Oh, yeah, <laughs> for sure. For sure. And, and again, it goes back to the whole theme of this this, this podcast is people first, right? Always yeah. coming through, through with a people first mentality. Love it. Yeah. Uh, question number four, in one sentence, what has been the biggest mistake you've made in your career? And what did you learn from that mistake? The biggest mistake that I've made is putting um, like the right person in the wrong seat. Mm. So I like somebody and I see their strengths, but I put them in the wrong position. And what it's taught me is to, again, just go back to my team and ask them questions about what they like and dislike about what they're doing. Personality assessments are huge for me, but I think being able to spend more time with someone before you bring them on board and observe them and what their life is like and what they like to do is super important. No, I think that that's that's right. Have you ever read the book Traction EOS? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. It sounds like you have because it's it would have been uh, yeah. a lot of learning lessons. I just finished the book and it's it's it personality tests. You know, understanding the right butt in the right seat. They talk a lot about that. So for those people who are listening to the show, definitely go out and look at uh, Traction yeah. EOS system. So awesome stuff. Uh, and the last question for you, April, is where can people reach you to continue the conversation? They want to be in your sphere. Where do they go? Uh, I have a YouTube channel. It's April Crosley, and they can find out more about kind of what we do in coaching and on a daily basis at aprilcrosley.us. .us. Awesome stuff. Well, look, April, I want to thank you for jumping on the show today. I learned a lot of stuff from you and, and your energy. I want to reflect some of the things that I took away. I think your story around uh, being uh, a teenage mom, having your son at 16 years of age and using that 
and the feeling that you got walking to the supermarket and paying for stuff through social social networks and social um, benefits and the stigma you, you you had around that really shifting your mindset to more abundance and 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 knowing that there's more to life than just oh now I'm I'm a teenage mom and now my son's going to be a teenage dad you know like trying to break that chain I think was was really important but that comes from uh, a place of pain but also comes from a place of, that you you understand that you need to grow right and, and you're cu- curious about certain things so I think that was all uh, one thing that I uh, took away from today's show and you know. Obviously, you, you want to have a massive impact on people. That's that's probably the other big thing. You want to impact yeah. as many people as you can. You're doing it for the right reasons. And I just love talking to people on the show who who come into the real estate investing world for that reason. Uh, did, I, did I leave anything out? I don't think so. Awesome stuff. Well, thank look, again, you. Thank you so much for jumping on the show. Enjoy the rest of your week and we'll catch up very, very soon. Well, there you have another cracking episode jam packed with some incredible advice from April. If you are looking to get into her sphere, go on to aprilcrosley.us and all the show notes from today's show will be on my website as well. Definitely follow her on her YouTube channel. If you're looking to ask her any tips or tricks about getting seller for carryback financing, anything that she's teaching on that channel, definitely check her out. She's a wealth of knowledge and I highly, highly recommend you hitting her up. I want to thank you all again for taking some time out of the day to tune in to continue Continue to grow your financial IQ because that's what we're all about on this show. And if you do like the show, the easiest way to give back is to give it a five-star review on iTunes. And we're going to do it all again next week. So remember, be bold, be brave, and go give life a crack.